Who's ready for some paper airplanes? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Collins. I'm the paper airplane guy, world record holder for paper airplane distance. Um, being the world record holder, you get invited to do fun things all the time, like be on the Conan O'Brien show. Um, he is just as goofy in person as he is on TV, so that was really fun. If you've never seen the world record throw, here it is. Gonna do it. Get up there, get up there, get up there, get up there, get up there. Ah! Have a pretty happy day. No, I did not throw the plane. Good question. And if you have questions, just yell them on up as we go along. Uh, that guy's name is Joe AU. He was an ex quarterback. He played in college for Cal and he played Arena League for three years. Um, so that was 226 feet 10 inches. How far is that? Well, if you like basketball, a basketball court's 100 feet long, so it'd be two basketball courts and another quarter of a basketball court. If you like football, that's standing in the end zone and throwing all the way to the other 25 yard line. So it's a pretty big throw. The old world record plane looked like that on the left. Very thin wings, you know, um, called a ballistic dart. You'd launch it at a 45 degree angle, it would crash into the finish line. That plane took three seconds to go 200 feet. And my plane's a glider, big broad wings, and you saw that it takes nine seconds to go 200 feet. You launch it level, it climbs on its own, it really flies and flares for that last third of the flight. Huge departure in the way it had been done and the way we broke the record. Big, big difference. And that's where we're going to start talking about paper airplanes, the difference between big wings and little wings. You guys have all seen little birds fly, right? How fast do they flap their wings? Little birds. Pretty fast, right? Like hummingbirds are the crazy end of that scale, right? What about big birds? How fast do they flap? Slower, right? Much, much slower. The same is sort of true with paper airplanes. All the planes you're going to see here are folded from the same size sheet of paper, so they all weigh exactly the same. They all weigh four and a half grams. And little wings have to work harder than big wings to lift that amount of weight. That's an idea called wing loading. And it's really the difference between a dart and a glider. This red plane is a dart. It flies pretty fast. You guys can run after that and get that if you want. This yellow plane is a glider. Now that difference in air speed is really just a difference in wing size. So let's, some of you guys know a little something about flight. The AMA, you guys are all flight geeks. So you know, hey, maybe the aspect ratio had something to do with that. So let's try the same experiment with different aspect, or the same aspect ratio. Which one of these guys will fly faster, do you think? The, yeah, the red one. Okay, we have a hypothesis. That's a good guess about what's going on. Let's see. There is the stealth dart and the max lock. Whoop, much slower. So let's take a closer look at the stealth dart here. Look at the back of the plane or that trailing edge. It's got a curve to it. On top of looking really cool, that also helps the plane be a little more slippery through the air. For those of you who don't know, that idea of being more slippery through the air is called low drag. You want all your planes to have low drag. Uh, if there were a corner back there instead of a curve, it would have way more drag. So that's one way to cut down on drag is to have a curve back there uh, instead of a corner. And you can see, instead of going all the way back, I started at the leading edge and just go about halfway back with that crease. And as long as you don't go all the way back, you end up with this really nice swept uh, trailing edge. Helps it be um, more low drag. Another way to cut down on drag is to lock the body of the plane together. Now, why would that make a difference? Because most paper airplanes flop open in flight when you throw them, right? So you got two vertical surfaces back here causing drag. If I lock that together, I've just cut the drag in half on the body of the plane. So there's kind of a fancy folding technique I'm using on this plane. There's, uh, it's called an outside reverse fold. I've eliminated the seam in the nose. So that's another way I've cut down on drag. I've locked the body of the plane together, and there's no seam in the nose of this plane because of this outside reverse fold. Now, I wasn't really thinking about drag when I invented this plane. This was kind of a crazy idea. We have maybe have a couple people here that were old enough like me to remember the very first Star Trek series, where if you were wearing a red shirt, you might not make it back from the planet. This is like the shuttlecraft that they used to use to land on the planet, right? So that cab over design there, that little wing on top, actually makes this a canard design. We're going to talk a little bit about canard designs later. But for now, I got this cool uh, cab over design, stair step wing, fun flying plane. Good job. Way to pick that up. Nice work. 
This is called the twin jet. More accurately, should be called the twin nacelle. If you look closely, those are not actually jet engines. They're jet engine coverings. That would make them nacelles. I'm still working on the turbofan ducted prop folding technique to go in there. Uh, this is called the ring thing. This is the hardest to fold plane in the new book. If you get the new book, do not start with this plane. You, you will come to the conclusion you can't fold a good paper airplane. You guys are all going to learn the world record plane today. So uh, that's definitely not true. You can fold a good plane. But um, the little wing in front does make this a canard design. This was really a design goal. I'd never done something so silly as a circle in the nose. I just wanted to see if I could do it. It does fly. It flies pretty good. But uh, don't start with that plane. That would be a mistake. Now, I mentioned earlier all my planes are folded from single sheets. Turns out that's not entirely true. This particular plane is two sheets of paper folded together right there at the front. You can kind of see the two sheets meeting there. I figured out how to do this guy after I figured out this guy, the interlock dart. Now, anybody here do origami? We usually have a couple people that have done origami before. Yeah, one or two. So this is a sink fold that um, creates the pockets and tabs. And if you take the tabs from that guy and put it in the pockets of that one, you get one of these. But the interlock dart itself is a really good dart. Throw a couple of those out there. Stay right there, guys. Here comes the second one. Heads up. And if you put two of those together, you get one of these. Right at Dwayne, yeah. <laughs> interlock biplane. This is a plane I'm particularly proud of. This plane won a distance competition, international distance competition. The trick with this particular competition was that you had to send your planes by mail all the way to Spain. Somebody else was going to throw them. Sometimes that happens. But the tricky thing was really getting a plane to survive shipping. Now, why would that be tricky? Because if you take a plane that's flying pretty good like that, Good work. You take a plane that's flying okay like that, you put it in a box and you hand it to the FedEx guy. You see where we're going here. Even if it rattles around inside the box and the tail feathers get bent just that much, a plane that was flying really good is no longer flying good. So step number one was to beat the FedEx guy. How do you do that? Well, you make a plane that has hexagon-shaped tail feathers. Hexagon shapes are one of the most structurally sound shapes you can make. You find them in honeycomb and nature. You find them in all kinds of high-tech sporting goods. You can really beat on the back of a hexagon shape, and it keeps flying great. Starfighter, award-winning plane. One of the things I like to do sometimes is make an airplane that kind of imitates something in nature. And this plane imitates a maple seed. You, can get, you just don't have to wait until this time of year to get your hands on one. You can fold one anytime you want. And the cool thing about this plane, it does exactly what you think it's going to do. It rotates as it flies. But because it rotates, it's easy to find the center of gravity. Every object rotates around its center of gravity. Every single object. Doesn't matter whether it's a paper airplane. If you were to throw a baked potato at the opposite wall in your home, as it was tumbling toward the wall, it would be rotating around its center of gravity. So this one is not going to go back there. You guys come up front here. I want you to watch closely. I want to have one of you guys point at the center of gravity. The center of gravity is going to be the center of spin. Okay, watch it fly. Did you see the center of spin? Where was the center of gravity on that guy? Right there, exactly. Let's do one that's a little trickier. This one is a crazy looking plane. This plane also spins as it flies. And you throw this one like you throw an American football. You let it roll off your fingertips. The faster it spins, the straighter it flies. Thank you. So who wants to guess where the center of gravity is on this plane? Oops. You just saw it fly twice. Who can tell me where the center of gravity is on this guy? Where is it? Yeah, right there. It's in thin air. It's not touching the plane. It's one of a number of interesting objects where the center of gravity is not on the object. Um, if you think about a two-bladed boomerang, when it flies, you, there's probably somebody throwing boomerangs at AMA today, right? There's got to be somebody doing that here. No? No boomerangs here? When you watch a boomerang fly, it's kind of a donut shape as it's hovering down. The inside of that donut hole is the center of gravity. Important safety tip. 
If you ever want to learn how to catch a two-bladed boomerang, you reach into the center of that donut hole and grab. That's the slowest moving part of the boomerang. If you catch it from the outside, it really, really hurts. Trust me. You don't want to do that. Bad news. Now, I studied origami pretty seriously for a few years with an idea toward taking all those folding tricks back to making high-performance planes, because I just thought it'd be cool. Just if you had a whole collection of planes, all you need is a sheet of paper, no cutting, no gluing, no nothing, just a sheet of paper, fold a great set of planes. But I will admit, sometimes the origami creeps back in too far. Nobody really needs a swan head stuck to a paper airplane. But if you could, why not? Nobody really needs a pelican plane either. You got that one right by the beak. <laughs> got him by the beak. What do you think? Which one of these guys is going to fly faster? The pelican plane or the swan plane? Let's find out. There's the swan. And there's the pelican. I'll leave that one alone. That's all right. No, no, no. I got that one. I got that one. Whoa. Yeah, if they're on the stage, I can probably get them. Thanks. I got one more replica plane. And this thing is weird. This is the bat plane. It did not start out to be the bat plane. It started out to be the seagull plane. And you can see I got the wing shape about right. Something really weird happened when I threw it for the first time. You got to watch closely. You guys are far enough away. You might not be able to see it. See the wings twitch a little bit as it was flying? You guys see that? I'll throw it one more time. I'll throw it a little closer to you guys. It kind of twitches, the wings twitch a little bit as it flies. So I had never seen a paper airplane do that before. That really had me puzzled. Did have no idea what was going on with that. It took me about two weeks to figure it out. Once I figured it out, I knew I could fold the same plane with much thinner paper. I used phone book paper. So phone books are like a non-volatile means of information storage. First social networking idea. Thin paper is the headline. So same plane folded the same way out of phone book paper. Easy, guys. Easy. Really, really super easy with that one. I should have warned you. This is like, throw it one more time just because it's fun. Yeah, it's very fragile. OK, just, I'll get this one, OK? Guys, relax for a second. It's alive. Not really alive. So any guesses on how that plane works? It's just a piece of paper. There's no muscles. There's no motor. What do you think? How's it work? It has to do with the shape and the thinness of the paper. That much is true. Anybody else out here? Yeah. Ah, this guy. This guy knows. So it's stalling. It's going through a rapid series of stalls. The center of the plane is very flexible. If you've ever had a, an airplane, a model plane, or a paper airplane do this stair-step pattern, that's what's happening with this plane. It's not adjusted well. It's a little bit tail heavy. So it climbs, it takes off and climbs, the wings flex together, it stalls, the wings relax, it flies and stalls and flies and stalls. So it's a terrible airplane. It's constantly stalling. But once you know the trick, you could scale it up and do something really fun. Ha! That's insanity. Don't throw it. Oh. Flapping paper airplanes. That is not a paper airplane. That'd be cool if it was, right? That's, if you look really closely, it's got five fingers on each hand. It's got an eyes, nose, mouth, tongue, horns, wings, barbed tail. Complicated, right? That's one sheet of paper, eight hours of folding. What? Perfectly OK to say, paper airplane guy, you need to get a life. I hear that all the time anyway. Two words in my defense, jury duty. I show that because a lot of people, shh, guys, shh, shh, shh. A lot of people who get interested in doing high performance planes give up on folding as a way to get there. I would say exhibit A, if you can dream it up, you can probably fold it. Now we're free to talk about ducks. We're not really going to talk about ducks. We're going to talk about canard designs. You guys probably all recognize this plane on the left, yeah? Right flyer? The plane in the center you might not recognize, but it's pretty famous. It's the Gossamer Albatross. It's the first aircraft to fly human-powered across the English Channel. The plane on the right is the Voyager. Burt Rutan designed first aircraft to fly all the way around the planet nonstop without refueling. One tank of gas, one lap around the world. Pretty impressive. What they all have in common is a little wing in front. This little guy right here, right there, 
and right there. And the way that little wing is important, it, you have to talk a little bit about stalls. We mentioned stalls a little bit earlier, but stalls work like this. If your aircraft is flying too slowly, the airflow can't stick to the wing. But the other way you get a stall is if you tilt the wing upward too much with regard to the airflow. So really easy for the airflow to stick to a wing in that configuration. You tilt it up a little bit, the air starts to come unglued. You tilt it up too much, the air comes completely unglued from the wing. And we call that a stall. So what happens with a canard design is that you angle this little wing at a higher angle of incidence. That is, you tilt it up more than the main wing. So when the plane gets close to stalling, this wing stalls first, drops the nose down, and this wing avoids stall phase. Now, here's the thing. You guys know way more about stalls than the Wright brothers did. All the Wright brothers knew is that everybody before them had this little wing at the back, and a lot of people died trying to figure out how to fly. The Wright brothers do the opposite of their contemporaries at the time, accidentally inventing the world's safest kind of aircraft. Pretty happy accident. Historians think that allowed them the time and space to figure out how to be a pilot. That's a pretty good accident. This is my canard design. Again, just one sheet, no cutting. I'm doing the same thing as most canard designers. You can see there's a little bend in that forward wing so that when it gets close to stall phase, the front stalls first, drops the nose down, and the main wing keeps flying. So what we have here is a stall-resistant paper airplane. Whoa. Does that count as a carrier landing? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, when I'm at home and I'm working by myself and I'm not in a room full of people that are nice enough to grab my planes and bring them back, it's nice to have a plane that does that. That's paper airplane juggling. That's been outlawed in some states. Most people guess when they see that plane fly for the first time that it got some rudder control in there to make it go left. Well, it does circle to the left, but guess what? It also circles to the right. And if I throw it straight, it does a loop. Wow, there it goes. So the loop is your first clue about what's going on with the plane. The loop tells you it's a little bit tail heavy and the plane climbs. That's thing number one. Thing number two has to do with the angle that the wings are stuck to the body of the plane. Of course, there are fancy words for that. It's called dihedral angle. And most planes that you're going to ride in, most good paper airplanes, the wings slope upward. You see some of these really high performance stunt planes, the wings are level or pointed down. But most planes you're going to ride in, positive dihedral. And that puts the lifting surface up over where all the weight is. So it looks like that's positive dihedral. The wings are there and the weight's down there. So if the plane goes cruising along and it gets rocked to one side, kind of like a pendulum, the weight swings back underneath the wings. So if I throw this guy that has positive dihedral leaned over, it rocks back to neutral and keeps on flying. So if you compare the positive dihedral angle plane to the boomerang plane, you start to see what's going on here. The boomerang plane is the opposite. The wings are drooping. It does not self-correct. So if I throw it leaned over, it's going to stay leaned over. And remember, it climbs. So you have to imagine a climb leaned over. It's a circle that way, or a circle that way, or a circle this way. It's all the same trick. The plane doesn't care. And you'll see the trick now. I'm throwing it leaned over, stays leaned over, circles back. Left, right, doesn't matter, doesn't care. So any plane with a negative dihedral angle, let's say uh, even the right flyer, now, the Wright brothers, again, everybody who was designing planes at the time of the Wright brothers was doing positive dihedral angle. You could let go of the controls, the plane would rock back to neutral. But they didn't understand what a stall was, and they were afraid of it so much, they didn't want to wrestle the stability of the plane. So the Wright brothers invented a plane you had to control 100% of the time. No dead stick stable. You can't take your hands off the controls. So historians also think this helped them be better pilots faster. They had to fly their plane 100% of the time. But once you know the trick, you can design paper airplanes for that. This is the fat glider. Wings are drooping. It can circle back. The max lock. Big broad wing glider. Wings are drooping. Circles back. But what you really need, if you're the paper airplane guy, is an aircraft that flies out, flips over, and flies back upside down. Okay, 
I know how wrong that is, okay? Just let me say that right off the top. So again, this, this plane has a very flexible center crease, and I'm working dihedral angle in a slightly new way here. I've got positive dihedral on the way out, and then after the stall, of course it's tail heavy and it stalls, the body is very flexible, flops open, and now I've got positive dihedral upside down. So it tracks straight out and straight back with a stall in the middle. Fun plane. So a few years ago, I got interested in breaking world records because I noticed if your book said world record holder on the cover, you could sell a few more books. Completely selfish reason to go after the first world record that I went after. So I went after time aloft, which is how long can your plane stay in the air with a throw? So I got the guy's book and folded his plane. He has a very good plane. I've got planes right here with that good a glide ratio, so I didn't think it was going to be that tough. Right up into the time, I went to YouTube and watched Ken Blackburn throw his plane. Ken Blackburn's right arm is a bazooka. My right arm, not so much. More like udon, more like wet noodles. I knew I was never going to be able to throw anything as hard as Ken Blackburn. I was going to have to come up with a different solution for the time aloft problem. This plane is my solution for the time aloft problem. Crazy paper airplane. I'm about to explain how I did that. Thanks for asking. So the first thing you notice about this plane is it's made from really lightweight paper, phone book paper again. It doesn't weigh very much, so it doesn't have to fly very fast to stay in the air. Again, the idea of wing loading. The second thing, and um, just as important, is called sink rate. Literally, the, plane, the rate the plane is sinking as it flies. Now this guy, if I drop it from head height, takes about five seconds. That's all right, guys. That's it. Back off, back off, back off. If they're up here, I can get them. Takes about five seconds to go six feet vertically. That's a really low sink rate. The sink rate is so low that all I need to do is walk behind it with this cardboard. As long as the top of the cardboard is leaned back a little bit, I'm scooping air upward as I move forward. As long as that air is moving up, the same speed the plane's moving down, the plane can ride right there on that wave of air. I have another plane that flies that way. This plane doesn't actually fly at all. It just kind of falls in an organized fashion. Yep, it's a two-inch wide strip of paper and it's just made to tumble. One long edge is bent down, one long edge is bent up. This is nine pound onion skin. You could easily use phone book paper. You can make one of these tonight when you get home. Two inches wide, the, the uh, length or the height of a phone book. Uh, one long edge is bent down, one long edge is bent up. That makes it tumble. There's a uh, crease or two down the middle of the thing so it holds its shape. Phone book paper, all lightweight paper is really flimsy. One end is up and one end is down and that makes it go in a straight line. Other than that, there's no real rules on these guys. You can make them different sizes. This is one made from uh, tissue paper, like you might wrap a gift with. And this one is small enough and light enough, you don't need the cardboard, you can generate enough updraft with just your hands. Now, there really is no physics involved with this one. This one is just magic. <laughs> Tumbling wing. Okay, those are my very best paper airplane tricks. Uh, um, one more word about big wings and little wings before we make the world record plane. Uh, physicists love to say stuff like air behaves differently around big wings and little wings. That would imply that air molecules sit there and look at the wing and go, oh, that's a big wing, I'm gonna do this this time. Now, air molecules do the same thing all the time. It's just that the curve on a big wing like that happens over the span of a foot or two, and the curve on that tiny wing is like over the span of a millimeter. And so just like race cars going around a track, if you try to do too tight of a turn for the, for the weight of your car, you'll go flying off the track. So that's why the airflow on a big wing looks more like this. Laminar flow, it can easily follow the shape of the wing at that size of a curve and at high speed. Whereas on a tiny wing, it becomes turbulent very fast. The flow becomes chaotic. It just can't follow that tight of a curve. And that's the difference between big wings and little wings. It's called scale effect, but it really just has to do with the mass of air molecules. I love that picture. That's just, just such a cool picture. Uh, so I've got some paper here. 
I bet I have two or three volunteers that would help me hand out paper. Yeah. I'm just going to move down here because it's easier for me to point at the big screen. Okay, so the first move we're going to do here is called a diagonal fold, and that's taking the top of the page and putting it against the side of the page. The crease is going to go through here. So we're starting here, going there. Starting here, going there. Uh, unfold that fold. We're going to make a diagonal crease the other direction, and we're just going to move this creased corner down to the other end of the crease, just like that. So starting here, going there. Starting here, going there. Take the creased corner and go down to the other end of the crease. We're making a big diagonal the other direction. Once you have that done, unfold that. We've got a big X in the page. Notice that there is a center to the X. We're going to use that center a little bit later. But for now, just note that it's there. This, you may have done diagonal folds before. This next crease is a little weird. <laughs> We're going to take, uh, if the corners of the ends of all the creases, and they kind of make an outline for a box or a square, right? That's a square shape there. We're going to take this right-hand side of the square and put it against this diagonal fold. The crease is going to go right up through here. So this side of the page, from this crease here to this corner here, is going to go right against the diagonal. So starting here, going there. Starting here, going there. Uh, we're going to do the other side, obviously. And there's a shortcut. There's a crease that goes from this corner we just moved out to the edge here. That's the old diagonal crease. Where that hits the outside edge, if we take this corner and put it at the end of this crease like that, everything else should line up. So we're starting here, going there. Starting here, going there. OK, remember I told you we we're going to use the center of the X. The time has come to use the center of the X. We're going to make a crease that goes straight across the center. The center of the X is right there. If you can't see the center of the X on this side, flip it over real quick. You can see the center of the X on the other side. You're going to make a crease that goes right through there. So keep an eye on that as you flip it back over. You're going to fold straight down across the center of the X. Now, here's the key. Here's the double check. Once you get it folded, the top layer crease, the old diagonal from the back side, is going to line up with the bottom layer crease, which is the diagonal uh, you're seeing on the front side. So the top layer crease lines up with the bottom layer crease on both sides. That's how you know you hit the center of the X. So now that we've done such a good job lining up these creases, we're going to follow them. We're not going to make any new folds on this next move. We're going to follow the creases on both sides, moving these corners to the inside just like that. So before we do the next move, in the spirit of full disclosure, Guinness rules allow one piece of what they call light duty sticky tape. In America, we would just say scotch tape. But why use two words when you can use four? Uh, so one piece of tape, 25 by 30 millimeters. You're allowed to cut that tape into as many pieces as you like. When I'm making the world record plane to try to actually break the world record, I take that tiny piece of tape and cut it into 16 pieces and put it all over the plane. We're not going to do that today. If you want to see how that works, I have a YouTube video on my channel, The Paper Airplane Guy, that will show you in excruciating detail exactly how that works. Today, we're taking a shortcut. We're taking this little tab here and folding it up over those two corners like that. So this little tab just goes straight up. This little tab that's pointed down here just goes straight up like that. And when we do the next fold, which is to fold the plane in half, it's going to lock everything together. We're going to fold the plane in half. We're going to flip it over first so that the clean side is up, the pristine fly, uh, side is up. Oops. And the crease is going to go from the point, from the top, straight down. And you're going to fold it in half like this. Now, the nose is pointed left. Don't be thrown because the nose is pointed left. We're just getting ready to make wings here. And you want to line up the rear corners. Don't worry so much about the center corners here. Those could be off a little bit. Make sure the back is lined up and the nose is lined up. So the wing crease, we're going to take this long edge and bring it right down to the bottom here. The crease starts at the sharp nose and goes up toward the tail. You just fold it down like that. You're just moving that long crease just right down to the bottom, just like that. You guys got it? OK, if you have one wing, obviously flip it over and make the other wing match. And hang on to your planes. Do not throw your planes yet. OK, your plane probably looks like this. The wings are drooping, right? So we were talking about positive dihedral angle. We want to do that to this design. And the easy way to do that on this plane, where all the layers meet, that little locking fold that we did on the underside, hold on to that with one hand. And by the way, that's the center of gravity. That's where you want to hang on to it when you're throwing it. So hold on to it with one hand like that. With the other hand, you're going to put one finger on one side, one finger on the other side, and at the front of the plane, just lift straight up. You're moving enough layers that the wings will probably stay up like that after you just flex them up once. That's how you're going to add a positive dihedral. Remember, that puts the lifting surface up over where the weight is. It'll rock back to neutral. Now, that's it. You got it. 
So the other thing we're going to do to this plane is called up elevator. Now, we're going to bend the back of the plane up. And here's why. Now, if you're flying a powered plane, you want the center of lift and the center of gravity lined up. And the plane will move along nice and level. Drag will be slowing the plane down the whole time. Drag is always slowing every aircraft down. And drag will slow it down. If you're in a powered plane, you just hit the gas. Simple solution. For a glider like this, you have to engineer in a way for the plane to pick up speed that's lost through drag. And the way you do that is you move the center of gravity, the heavy part of the plane, in front of where all the lift is. And remember, the plane's going to, OK, back up. The plane's going to rotate around the center of gravity. So if, if the center of lift is behind the center of gravity, that's going to lift the tail up. Now the nose is pointed at the ground. That's good news. We can accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second. But if you don't do anything else, it's just going to auger in. So you have to do something to get the nose back up. And what you do is bend the back of the plane upward just a little bit. See, I'm way behind here on my slides. Here's the other wing. There's positive dihedral. And here's a little up elevator. So we're going to bend the back of the plane upward just a little bit. So now you've got the center lift behind the center of gravity. That lifts the tail up. It's flying downward. When it picks up enough speed, enough air will bounce off of that little uh, upward bend to push the tail back down. So it's this dance between where the center of gravity is and how much up elevator you put back here that's going to make your plane fly level. If you've got too much up elevator, it's going to stall and do that porpoise action. If you get just the right amount, it's going to fly nice and level. That is like way, 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 way too much. You've bent half of the wing upward. Subtlety is the, yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's a subtle little bit of, whoops. OK, so I would ordinarily say we're going to test fly but now we're, this, we're going to do a mass launch all at Dwayne, who's the camera guy back here. See that red light? That's what we're all throwing at. You guys ready? Here we go. Little positive dihedral, little up elevator. In three, two, one, launch. <laughs> I'm John Collins, the paper airplane guy. My booth is right behind the main stage here. Thank you guys for coming to AMA. Thank you.